My name is Clark Waterfall. I'm a member of one of the pioneer families of Whitley County. My grandfather uh, arrived from, great grandfather arrived from Switzerland uh, and uh, after a stop around Columbus, Ohio, uh, of a couple of years, he came to Whitley County in 1854. So, um, my family history goes quite far back in Whitley County, but I've always been quite interested in the earlier history, the 1550s and the 1600s and, uh, of Whitley County, when the Indians lived here. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the tribe was the Miami tribe, and uh, there are several places in the county that uh, uh, record their presence. Uh, of course, they had a great chief in, uh, who was born in, in uh, 1752, Michigan We know him as Little Turtle. Little Turtle was quite a, a uh, astute, well-educated, well-thought-of Native American. And uh, so it's a lot of the history of the battles and all that go along with him. Uh, between uh, traders, between uh, the uh, Native Americans and our Native Englishmen uh, are uh, written well in history. But uh, I uh, am always been quite interested in that Native American history. But let's jump forward a little bit. I uh, uh, was born in Columbus City, uh, I, uh, but I didn't go to school in Columbus City. Uh, my father was a carpenter, and uh, about uh, in the 1920s, uh, he uh, was out of contract work, and uh, we moved to Fort Wayne. Uh, so I was educated in the Fort Wayne school system, went to Northside High School, from there on to Michigan State University. But uh, I was always spent my summers in Columbus City because uh, I'm a third generation veterinarian and on my mother's side of the family. So uh, I lived over here in the summertime to be with my veterinarian grandfather and my uncle. Uh, the, uh, so I uh, was uh, played with the kids from Columbia City and uh, got chided because I wasn't uh, an eagle. Uh, got uh, always, uh, when Northside played Columbia City, uh, if they, Columbia City won, I didn't hear the last of it. So that's part of the history. Uh, the, uh, but there's earlier history, of course, from my grandfathers, both of them uh, living in Columbia City, and my father. There are interesting stories passed down of the history of Columbia City through them to me, and that's probably why today I'm so interested in the history of Columbia City. Uh, did you know about the last six shooter on the streets of Columbia City. No. Well, a six-shooter police uh, was a man that came arrived uh, in the early 1900s uh, on the uh, Pensy Railroad. Uh, at that time, it was the uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago mm. Railroad. That was the and, and station that, up on that Chicago came to Street. here in, in uh, 1856, I think. And uh, he arrived from the west. I asked uh, the uh, man how to find uh, a certain fur company that was in town. Uh, the uh, the drayer that who was hauling things from the depot down to the center of town said, "Well, just jump aboard. I'll take you down." And uh, they uh, uh, he noticed that the man had a six shooter on his side. He had one of these uh, sheep jackets with the fur on the inside and the hide on the outside. He had, a, of course, what we call a cowboy hat on. And, uh, but he wasn't talkative. He didn't have much to say. But he wondered where the Charles Dorrit Fur Company was. Well, it happened that it was down there where now our city hall sits. And uh, uh, so uh, he says, well, that's uh, the drear said, I, I'm going to the clubs at the hotel, and it's just two doors down from the clubs in the hotel, so you can just run on down there from there. So, so as the man got there, he flipped him a quarter as he got off of, and 
he walked on down uh, to Charles Doriot's fur company. Now it just so happened that there was a man named Jolly who was the keeper of the firehouse, which was at that location too, Columbia City Firehouse, and he happened to have a horse tied in the doorway of the firehouse, currying it, when he saw this man with a six-shooter coming down the sidewalk, and he spoke to him, the man didn't just look straight ahead, so he fell in behind him. I'm going to see where this guy's going. Well, he says, when he stepped in the door, he says, I'm looking for Charles Doria. Charles Doria uh, said, I'm Charles Doria. Uh, he was back at the counter. Well, he says, uh, back last spring, I sent you $2,000 worth of furs, and I only got $1,400 back. Now I'm here to collect what's left, plus two-way ticket from Wyoming to Chicago, plus my meals, plus a bottle of whiskey for each way. Mm -hmm. I want to collect. Well, Jolly was to later say, well, you know, uh, he, he didn't take Dory long to get his checkbook out, and he hastily wrote a check for that amount of money. And as the stranger backed out the door, he almost tripped over Charlie's feet, but he's, he said, this check better be good because I'll cash it before I leave town. And the last time he, he Charlie noticed that he went across to the Providence Bank, came out of there, went on down to a restaurant on the street there, and apparently had a bite later, he saw him walking back towards the depot. Uh, and that, to our knowledge, is the last time a six-shooter appeared on the streets of Columbia City. My goodness. So, so uh, there, there were some other things. There were things that's, that were claimed that didn't happen, too. Uh, for instance, we had a school teacher that was teaching out at uh, Poor Hook, mm -hmm. which was, uh, uh, and uh, she had one arm. And the story in town was that she was Jesse James's mother. Mm -hmm. And Jesse James, uh, of course, when he escaped from the from the men that were trying to capture him, there was a gun battle, and his mother, she was at home. His mother lost her arm in Missouri. That was, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, uh, here uh, we. I, I always told the the story when I was talking about the town that, that uh, Jesse James' mother was once a school teacher at Whitley County. Well, our historical society, uh, Susan Ritchie, who mm -hmm. was our curator, uh, decided to test that theory, so she wrote to the museum out in Missouri. And she got an emphatic no that Mrs. Jesse James had never uh, well, her name was an Amelda Samuels. Mm -hmm. She had married Dr. Samuels, and that Amelda Samuels had never left Missouri. So some lady had used the name and gotten a job, and she was an imposter because she was not Jesse James' mother. So I had to delete that out of my story. It's from Columbia <laughs> City. Uh, of course, we always liked uh, the Brick Street that we call Chauncey, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and if you remember, the, we wanted to keep that a brick street. And I'm not just sure what year anymore. The, 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 but there were a lot of volunteers that helped A lot of volunteers. That. So we took up those bricks, bricks cleaned them, and laid them back down again. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was Silk Stocking Row. Well, why was that called Silk Stocking Row? Well, the prominent businessmen of the town lived up on that street. And uh, some of our doctors. Uh, a lawyer, uh, a boot maker, uh, a harness maker, uh, a butcher. I don't know about a candlestick maker. I never <laughs> heard about that. But, but anyway, they lived up on, and they, at that time, silk stockings were quite expensive. They were the men that could afford to buy their own silk stockings. Now, they didn't give that name to the street themselves. No, it was a Jealous people outside sure. said, "Well, oh, that's stick silk stock and roll out there." So, so that's some of the early history of Columbia City. 
uh, of course, uh, uh, there uh, we could trace back to the various uh, uh, Tom Marshall's office, for instance. Uh, you know where the Star Insurance Company used to be, Eslick Insurance, mm -hmm. and that building on the second floor of that was the Thomas Marshall Law Offices. Tom Marshall, our vice, our vice president under Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had his offices there. He was uh, a character, and there were a lot of town characters. And uh, you can talk about uh, about our town characters. Some of them uh, real prominent. Well thought of, some not so well thought mm -hmm. of. We had a con man originally here. He happened to be a brother of a very prominent and a son of a very prominent physician in town, really? Dr. Linville. Doc, and his name was Hayes Linville. He found that it was easier to con people than it was to work for a living. And uh, there's many stories of Hayes Linville, and probably one of my favorite is when he all at once downtown across between the street lights was a sign that says coming. Well, everybody knew if something was coming, it was coming to the uh, Tuttle Opera House. Mm -hmm. Tuttle Opera House was down over what now is the Eagles, down in, in the Billy's Eagles. And the Tuttle Opera House, uh, when anything coming, they would put a, 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 a sandwich board out in front. And everybody rushed down to see what was coming. Well, it said that night it was night of philosophical truths. Uh oh. <laughs> and so uh, uh, that all at once the signs came down coming here, here. Well, everybody rushed down. They should have known something was wrong when Hayes Linville was selling tickets at the mm. street ticket office <laughs> down on the street because the opera house was up on the second floor. Well, they got up to the opera house and they, that night, those people who bought tickets, and uh, they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And you know, they had wooden chairs up there, and they began to grab the chair by the seat and jump up and down, <laughs> make a lot of noise, you know, on the wood floors. Mm -hmm. Finally, the curtains opened. Here's an old codger in overalls, sitting on what's an artificial stump on there. Wooden shavings all around him. He was squiddle. And he said, always squiddle from you, and you'll never cut yourself. Always squiddle from you, and you'll never cut yourself. Philosophical truth, see. Mm. And uh, so all at once, curtains go down. Well, they have my servant, that's just the start, you know. And time went by, and they got impatient. They begin to rack their chairs again. Finally, curtains come up, crosses, big sign, gone. Everybody rushed down to the ticket <laughs> office, but so was Lin Hayes Linville. He was gone too, with all the receipts, of course. Well, that was just one of the many stories of Hayes Linville. He, he did a lot of different things that were actually con operations <laughs> for the people of Clement City. So, uh, the, uh, the Columbus City has a very interesting history. Uh, of, of course, uh, we had uh, uh, a, uh, a, a man who becomes Surgeon General in the United States, uh, and Merritt, um, I would have trouble thinking of his name right now, uh, but uh, at the same time he was Surgeon General of the United States in Washington, we had a Vice President, Marshall, mm -hmm. Thomas Marshall. And we had our famous friend, Hayes Linville. He was in the hospital there claiming he'd been gassed in World War I. And they were, he was looking for a Section 8. Well, a Section 8 in the Army is insanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was wanting to out of the service and he was going to get a Section 8 and, but they weren't ready to give it to him until he told them uh, that, uh, that the Surgeon General, that he had played with the Surgeon General, he had read law with the Vice President of the United States, and they all figured, well, any man that would say that was crazy, and they let him out. But it was so, true. So, but it was true. <laughs> so, so that's uh, uh, 
there, there are many, there, you could write a book on Hayes Linville and some of the interesting characters. Tom Marshall himself was a very interesting person. Mm -hmm. Could have been, should have been, President of the United States when Wilson, President Wilson had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And I claim that Edith Wilson was the first woman president of the United States. And, and uh, she took over, she closed Marshall out of everything uh, and uh, took over. And uh, even though Marshall went every day to inquire of his health, oh, he's getting along fine and, and everything, he'll be back in his office and such. But she was handling all the business. Mm -hmm. And so I say Edith, to, Edith uh, was uh, uh, the first woman president of the United States. Uh, the, uh, uh, at the same, not at the same time, but kind of interesting, uh, we had uh, some very prominent people in Hollywood. We had a very prominent actor who played in High Noon mm -hmm. and who, uh, Dean Jagger. And Dean Jagger was born out here in Thorn Creek Township. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean Jagger taught school for one year out here in Dean. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Uh, got the urge to be an actor and went into Chicago and from there to Hollywood. And we know Dean Jagger was in several movies. Well, some of the movies played in was written by a man called Dean Jagger. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Lloyd Douglas. Mm -hmm. Lloyd Douglas was uh, uh, a native son. He didn't live here very long, but his father was the president, was the, uh, a uh, Lutheran minister in town here, and of course he wrote some very, very well read uh, books mm -hmm. like uh, The Magnificent Obsession, and uh, all those became movies. So at the t same time Jagger was in Hollywood, he was there as a consultant for his movies. Two clubs able. Here was a town of 5,000. Yeah. At the same time we had two men in Washington, and at the same time, we had two men in Hollywood. What town can claim that yeah. distinction? 5,000 people in this town, two prominent men in Washington, two prominent men in Hollywood. And yeah. Hollywood came to Columbia City. Yes, they did. The premiere of White Banners. The, the White Banners uh, premiere was shown, I think in, was that 38? I believe so, I think yeah. it was 1938. And Lloyd Douglas come back, and the museum has a picture of Lloyd Douglas standing on the porch of Thomas Marshall's house down there with Mrs. Marshall. Tom Marshall died in 25. Mm -hmm. So he came, and Mrs. Marshall, who was living in Indianapolis at the time, came up for the premiere and was talked. And we have a picture of the two of them oh, on the wow. porch talking with one another at that, at that time. Uh, or oh, some little other little facts like uh, when Tom Marshall got the, uh, nom the Democratic nominated mm -hmm. nomination for governor, uh, he was found riding a donkey in the doors of the house. As a Into the house? In through the house. Oh my! And uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the women, uh, Democratic women of the town, uh, of course, they had a, an all-night affair there as they were uh, waiting for election results, and they had hung banners up, red, white, and blue banners all around the house. It rained that night, and Tom Marshall's house became red, white, and blue. Oh, my! So that's another happening. <laughs> so, well, I can go on and on, but there's, uh, I, I love the history of Columbia City. I am proud that I was able to come back here and the people in the town support, supported me well, well in my profession and they've treated me fine ever since. We have some real fine people here, still have some real fine people here and we, no, not of what's the least is the fine Peabody Library that well, we you. still call Peabody Library but it's the Bar Public Library. Thank you very much. Thank you.